All right, we're going to get started. I'm sure some more people trickle in, but um, thank you for coming. Welcome. Um, my name is Chelsea DiGiuseppe, and I'm the marketing manager for UNH Innovation. Um, this year's Wild Catalyst Seminar, uh, our theme is launching research-based uh, startups. So our aim is to help de demystify um, the startup process and explore the opportunities, challenges, and pitfalls of launching a business um, by hearing about real life successes and failures straight from the innovators and entrepreneurs themselves. So while our general topics will be universal to all entre entrepreneurial minded individuals, um, there's an emphasis on starting a business based on um, university re uh, research born innovations. Um, so we're really excited to explore this intersection of entrepreneurship and academia. Uh, we have a really great lineup of speakers this year. Um, our next month uh, will be, the seminar will be held on November 16th. It's a little bit early because of Thanksgiving, um, but we'll be hearing from Dr. Eric Fossum, and he's an engineering professor and the associate provost for innovation and technology transfer at Dartmouth. And uh, he is known, best known for inventing the image sensor that is used on smartphone cameras. So we have him to thank for our smartphone cameras. And he holds over 160 patents, so it should be a really good um, conversation. Um, so before I introduce our speaker, I just want to go um, over a little bit of housekeeping. Um, a word of thanks for our very generous seminar sponsors. We have Hamilton Brooks Smith Reynolds, and they're a Boston-based, full-service intellectual <coughs> property law firm. We have Finch and Maloney. They're a Manchester-based law firm that provides intellectual property counseling and services to technology companies. And we have Saunders and Silverste Silverstein, uh, a law firm in Amesbury, Mass, that provides services related to trademarks, copyrights, uh, internet software, and entertainment law. Um, following the presentation, uh, we invite you to stay for appetizers and beers and some networking. Um, just remember that um, the Adult beverages are for 21 plus. <coughs> I think that's it. Oh, and if you are an I2 Passport student, don't forget to swipe at the kiosk, which is the front, uh, near the sign-in sheet. Near the sign-in sheet. Uh, so if you hadn't haven't got it, grab that on the way out. Okay. Um, so our speaker this evening is Dr. Kevin Short. He's a professor of mathematics here at UNH. Um, Dr. Short has been working with UNH Innovation for many years, um, and he is a research commercialization trailblazer at UNH, um, having started the first university um, spin-off company uh, ever at UNH called Chaoticom, and that was in 1999. Uh, his experience includes <coughs> founding or co-founding two companies based on his research, both of which have now been acquired. Um, his company Sedum Technologies was acquired just this past July by a UK-based company called Exmos, and he remains the chief scientist for them. Um, <clears throat> so we're really excited to hear from him and learn from his experience and expertise in research commercialization and entrepreneurship. And if we're lucky, um, and we, he has some time left, he might even uh, explain how he came to be a Grammy Award winner. So lots of surprises. <laughs> Thanks, Chelsea. Thanks, everybody. Um, as Chelsea mentioned, I was the first spin-out person, so I was sort of a guinea pig. And so one of the things I'm going to try to talk about, and I welcome questions on, is how things have changed from when we first did it to um, where things are now. So I'm going to try to hit on some things about you know, how you deal with this as a faculty member what things were like when we did the first spin out, um, some stuff I did in between spin outs, uh, and then the latest thing I've been doing. And I'm going to try to go through reasonably quickly so that people have a chance to ask questions. So for me, the motivation was that uh, I always felt more like an inventor. Uh, I had a summer job working at IBM, and that's when I had my first invention. And it was like the coolest thing I ever did was to just think about one thing really, really hard. And it was, I don't know, I really liked it. And um, I, that's stuck with me ever since then. So I know I'm a math professor, and I teach in a math department, but I don't really feel so much like a professor as I do someone who wants to find ways to apply things. So I'm an applied math professor, so I guess that's a good combination there. Um, and I really wanted to see. 
I, any of my ideas used in society. Um, I've spent a lot of time reading papers, and I know that's what a lot of faculty members do, but I oftentimes don't see those papers translate into anything that um, we see in our daily life. And so I always thought that would be cool to do. And then um, it turns out that the math funding agencies, at least 23 years ago when I started here, they believed that math professors needed a good supply of paper and pencils. And so <clears throat> it was really hard to get funding for the kind of things I wanted, like supercomputers and coders and things like that. So in some sense, I felt like I absolutely had to get resources somewhere else. And in case you hadn't noticed, UNH doesn't have like a multi-billion dollar endowment, so they weren't going to write any big checks, but they were very helpful to try to get the company started. So um, the first spin out stuff, it turned out that I was breaking these chaotic communication schemes that were being published. And the original thought was that um, it would be super secure and you know, the na nation's secrets could be trusted to these communication schemes. And so um, a grad student and I started looking at it. We broke some of these chaotic communication schemes. Then the government came in and said, well, maybe we should fund this guy to do a little bit of work. I think the um, CIA and the NSA figured that if uh, one person and a grad student can break these codes, they don't have to worry about them too much. And that's pretty much what happened. Um, but in the course of doing this work, we, we found that we could create a communication scheme we couldn't break. And then in the course of that, we discovered these things called couplets, which were sort of a new type of waveform. And I put, so the first project was sort of a grad student project, Andy Parker. And um, then some undergraduate students wanted to have a project. And so I said, well, these things look pretty, ma pretty much like music signals. And so one of the students was a music major. The other was a DJ. And so they decided to start playing these waveforms out of speakers. And they were blown away because a single waveform would sound like a saxophone or a calliope or um, some of them sounded like flutes. And so we built a music synthesizer out of it. And around this point, we started thinking that maybe this stuff should be patented. And at the time, UNH didn't have a commercialization department. Uh, it was under consideration. We had some consultants from outside helping the university to figure out how to do this. And um, I started talking to them. They eventually joined UNH. So this was all at the very beginnings of what to do. We filed a few patents. And um, some other people said to me, well, it's fine to have a secure communication technique. It's fine to have. Um, synthesized music, but if all you're going to do is Muzak that can play for a season in a store, there's probably not that much commercialization potential. So then we built a compression algorithm out of it and um, filed patents. Um, one of the, the person who wrote my first patent actually hangs out here in the um, e-center, I think on Wednesdays. It, it could be every Wednesday, or it could be other days too, but I only see him on Wednesdays. And um, his name is Paul Remus. He was from a firm out in um, Concord, I guess. And the, one of the patents he wrote went through the patent office faster than any patent we've ever heard about. And it was, I think, held for about six weeks before they told us that it was going to be issued. So that was pretty cool. We knew we were onto something unusual. But UNH had never done a startup. They didn't have any policies. They didn't have any procedures. And how many people are associated with the university here? OK. so. For people who've ever dealt with sort of administrative level or faculty dean level and up, you'll find that um, there are a lot of people who chime in about stuff. And even if they don't know anything about the things that happened ahead of time, they find out about it later and they sort of jump in with their opinions later. And so um, I always tell people that at the university, when people say yes, all it really means is that they're reserving the right to say no later. So. At any rate, this sort of thing went back and forth. And um, we had some really good support from key people. So Bob Dalton uh, sort of held the role that Mark Saddam had before um, earlier. Uh, Jeff Soule is in the business school. And Jeff said to me, he said, well, you're a math professor. You must be fully qualified to run a, a business, which he was joking about. And so since I didn't know anything about running a business, he thought he would put me in touch with some people who knew a lot more. And so he put me in touch with uh, Bob McRae and Jeff Pollack. Uh, Bob McRae was one of the 
big angel investors in the state of New Hampshire. And uh, he just died actually a year ago. Um, but these guys sat me down and told me what to expect. Things like investors don't want you to be the CEO. They want you to be the CTO. They want you to stay on the technical side and not run the company. Let someone else run the books, things like that. Um, and so they made it so that I didn't embarrass myself when I started talking to investors. And then we had support from Ken Appel was my chair. Uh, Joanne Leitzel was the president of the university at the time. But we really didn't have policies in place. So it turned out that most of the university policies were first worked out with the first spin out. And, um, they ended up, I think, in a pretty reasonable place, but for a long time, it was uh, hit or miss. We were a little worried if it was ever gonna happen. What time frame is this, 90s? This is 1999, and um, yeah, I think around 1999. And I think we got everything done within, was it six months or a year? Something like that. But there was a, a period where we were trying to get everything in place. So, we decided that we would try to launch a spin out. And so here's the first big question to VC or not to VC. That is the question. And if this doesn't resonate with you, VC stands for venture capital um, or venture capitalist. And some people would call them vulture capitalists. And nonetheless, these are major movers in starting up companies in the United States. They put lots of money in, but they also get a lot of control. And so um, I've had experiences with angel investors as well as venture capitalists and um, there is comparison and contrast contrast between them. So feel free to ask questions about that later. So anyway, we originally started with the Ecoast Angels, which is local here on the Seacoast, and Kodiak Venture Partners. We later brought in um, Charles River Ventures, which is one of the venerable um, investment VCs in the country, and Star Ventures from um, Israel. And um, we had a lot of firepower, a lot of money behind us, but that didn't mean they wanted to invest because it turned out that um, we launched our company just as the internet bubble burst. So uh, it turned out that there was no investment in the country for the most part for about 18 months. And so that was absolutely torturous. But um, we managed to survive and we ultimately launched the first music download services to cell phones uh, in Europe, North America, and you know, down, down under. Uh, you may have seen I can, I can already look around the room and see that many people were too young to even notice this, but um, in the early 2000s, there were ads on television where Sprint was, you know, someone would take out their phone and this little mark would come through the sky and their phone would start playing music. And so Sprint put together all this ads and they had absolutely nothing to do with that service. It was completely run by us. But we were the first people to do it, it was really cool. And we actually sponsored the Super Bowl show uh, that year. We brought the Rolling Stones to the Super Bowl, which I apologize for. Um, they were only in their 60s then. I'm sorry? They were only like 60 years old then. Yeah. Years well, I'll tell you, I, th I thought I was going to look so cool to my kids. The halftime show was coming. I had my kids sitting on a couch. I have four kids, by the way. And so I'm sitting there watching, and the Super Bowl, the, the halftime show starts, the Stones start playing and my kids start laughing their heads off, absolutely cracking up. They're rolling off the couch and they're like, they're so old. <laughs> and, and I realized I would never be cool with my kids no matter what I did. And um, I've consistently achieved that level ever since. So um, it was a pretty exciting period. And I, I have to admit, one of the coolest things I've ever felt was knowing that this stuff was going out there. This was built on a compression algorithm that I had essentially designed from scratch. Uh, it meant that the songs were, this is actually before 3G networks, and it was before smartphones. So um, we were running over networks that have very limited bandwidth, and we were four times smaller than an MP3 with higher quality. So it was pretty cool, and it's an incredible feeling to actually put something out into the marketplace. Oh, before I say this though, I should also say that I brought some props and there's a story associated with this. This is part of a war story. This was the first tethered, we didn't want to do it, but we were forced to do it by Siemens, music playing device. This is actually a fraud. This is just plastic. But Siemens sent it to us and told O2 that they really developed their product and the chips fell out of that baby. Um, this is the first music player. It was supposed to be 
connected to your phone so you would like walk around like this, which we also thought was a stupid idea, but O2 forced us to do it. Um, uh, we could, this is one of the first smartphones. It's a Sony Ericsson P900, which um, I kept for many, many years, so many years that when my students all had iPhones and I was using this, they would come up and say, that's a cool phone, where'd that come from? And I said it was from before they were born. Um, <laughs> This is the P800, which preceded that one. And this is the, probably the second or third um, Microsoft phone that was ever produced. We were out in um, Redmond visiting with Microsoft, and the guy who was in charge of services got this thing on his desk. He had two of them. And he said, you think you can run on this? And we said, yeah. He said, take it. And the application, we actually wrote the first smartphone app. They weren't even called smartphone apps. Well, maybe there's someone else who would argue about that, but it's arguably the first smartphone app, and it still runs. So if someone wants to see it later, we can turn the phone on, and um, it will play music for you. Oh, and for, for the rest of you, the young people in here, just want you to know, phones used to come with manuals. <laughs> this is a phone manual. Yeah. I can't get students to read a textbook. But um, this was the manual for the phone. We did some testing with Berkeley students. We gave them a whole write-up of how to use the app. They slid it aside, picked up the phone, and started hitting buttons. And we realized, whoa, we're in trouble. Um, they also, the phones also came with CDs to install software. So those days are gone. But I like to think that we brought some of that about. I try not to think about the students who walk in front of cars while they're looking at their smartphones. But um, traffic fatalities are still low in town. So overall, this was a missed opportunity. Our, um, we were incredibly innovative. We were so on the bleeding edge that um, things that we were trying to do weren't really known to be possible. Um, in fact, we, we first did this on what was called an iPack. So everyone thinks of i as associated with um, uh, Apple. But the iPack actually was a, like a Palm Pilot device. And they had a ability to slide in a cell phone connector in the back of it. So we built this thing and started, we built a server to start downloading music. And we found out that they weren't sending the bits properly. And we called them up and said, look, uh, your downloads aren't right there. You're using it? You're using the data network? We didn't know anyone could even do this. So we were that bleeding edge that the networks didn't know that would happen. Um, oh, and I should tell you that when you signed up for our service, we actually changed your billing route. We had the ability, as a little small company, to change the connection between your phone and the billing network. We knew where you were at all times, all kinds of cool things, but um, <laughs> it's probably still true for all I know, but I'm not working in that area. Okay, um, so I said I've got the earliest smartphones. The VC investors wanted to cash out early. Uh, that's a little bit sad because we had a lot of crucial what are called early mover patents. Uh, the first smartphones before our app, if you started playing music on a phone like this, you didn't get your phone calls. How many students would have used their phones if uh, they could play music on it but they couldn't get their calls? Anyone in the room? Students don't have phone calls now. Yeah. <laughs> they have texts. Oh, so that's when they're in the classroom and they go, <sighs> and, I, and I won't let them look at their phone? Yeah. So it used to be that when they first came out with these phones, if you were playing your music, there were no cell phone calls, period. They figured you'd want it to go to, um, you know, want it to go to an answering machine. And when we tested this with the Berkeley students, they just looked at us like, are you crazy? We've got to get all our calls. So we figured out how to monitor the incoming phone calls, pause the music, and um, let the call come through. Yep. So were you selling a product or a service? We actually had to sell the service. Um, we didn't intend to because all the companies were setting up data services, so every single major cell phone provider in the world did that. But then they bankrupted themselves on the lottery for 3G network, and they canceled all their services. So selling your product, you had to make it into a service. We had to turn the product into a full service where we had the servers. In fact, we bought Telenor's service group, and um, that's how we suddenly, in one week, we became a server company. And we had other problems because some early investors in real networks, how many people remember real networks? They said it cost $500 million to set up a server because that's what it cost them. We set it up in one week for about $2,000. So things change really fast in this area. Someone else had a question? Yeah. What's an early mover? 
Well, that's the kind of thing you only know if you've taken, if you've cut yourself on, on the edge of something that hadn't been done before. So we were the ones who first found out that you would not get your cell phone calls if you were using anything else on your phone, right? So we figured out how to get around that. They abandoned that patent. So the first, the, the first iPhone everyone thinks of is actually the iPhone 3. There were two versions ahead of time, and they were flip phones like this, and they weren't very good. And if you were using music player, you wouldn't get your cell phone calls. So that kind of thing. Um, we also, well, I'll, I'll cover some of these things in war stories, but. Your VC, why not? Was that because you weren't cash flow positive or because they needed cash for their funds? Well, these companies had so much money, they didn't need it. It's just that, remember, we had just come through the, um, the internet bubble burst. And they were looking for some wins. We were doing very well, um, but we had, we had developed things like, <laughs> remember when the Red Sox won the World Series the first time? One of my engineers decided, I'm going to test something cool, which will be that your data server will find you wherever you go. So he loaded a stack of CDs. Those are, for those of you who are students, CDs are plastic things like this, and they hold music, and you paid for them. Um, and so he loaded a stack of CDs onto the computer, and every day he drove around following the Red Sox, and every day he would turn on his phone, and the network would find his phone, download music onto his phone, and he would play it out through his car speakers. I mean, we were just totally on the cutting edge. And the, the investors like, oh, no, no, we just want to make profit on what we've done. Um, I had built a video compression algorithm that I was going to use with ESPN. And anyway, a lot of bad things happened because they wanted to get out early. But it turns out that at one point, I think the statistics were that we had something like 60 to 80 percent of all the um, data traffic on the wireless networks. And I mean, that's the kind of position Amazon was in 10 years, well, five years actually even earlier. And they just, they didn't really want to keep investing in it. So that's sort of when I um, begged and came back to the university. But um, the other part of the um, bastardized Shakespearean quote is the slings and arrows that come after to be or not to be. And so when you're an early mover, you have to suffer the slings and arrows. And um, if you don't, you don't get anything out there. So that's uh, part of the game. So a couple things I wanted to mention. Um, having patents is really important, but it's not everything. Right? So uh, investors want to know that you have defensible uh, technology, so you've got to get some patents in place. Um, there were a lot of struggles here at UNH trying to figure out what's the right way to do it. Does the university um, take a big ownership stake in the company? Does the university try to keep a smaller stake in the company? Uh, what's the role of the faculty member? Do they get do they have to leave the faculty or come back or things like that? They all worked out to a very reasonable place. Um, but there are some interesting things. Having the university behind me sort of helped me sort of preserve my independence. And I'm going to talk about this a little more later. Um, and I was able to sort of carve out the ability to have research freedom still at the university. And I think for a lot of faculty members, I'm not sure that this is something that would come to mind immediately, that the university in some sense helps you protect part of your research career. At least that's what I found. And um, I recently had to use this leverage, um, which I'll talk about later. All right, so um, the, as I said, when the investors wanted to stop really developing technology, I decided I'm a researcher, I'm gonna go back to the university. So that's what I did. And I had been giving some talks and stuff, and um, this company, Planjet Processes, came up to me after I was giving a talk at a, um, a um, audio, what's it called? The audio Engineering Society Conference. And he said, old recordings have oscillations in them that are called wobble and flutter. And um, you say that you're really good at analyzing this stuff mathematically. Do you think you could do this, help me out, basically, re restoring music? And so I started working with this guy and I just, I didn't want to deal with lawyers or anything, so I didn't do this right at all. I totally did it wrong. I just did it for uh, his word that he would, you know, pay me, things like that. And um, so it turned out that what they used to call wow and flutter were exactly the same thing from, the, from a mathematical perspective. And once I realized that, I was able to do a, a lot of things with it. I fixed some of his algorithms, and um, we ended up restoring a lot of cool stuff like the 25th anniversary edition of um, the Close Encounters of the Third Kind movie. Um, we restored the audio on that. Um, we did uh, most of the Grateful Dead albums that were released, we did. Um, 
uh, yeah, did a Woody Guthrie album, which was very significant from a historical basis. And um, that one actually turned out to be a little bit more fun than I expected because um, we got to go to the Grammys. And um, so I'm just going to show these pictures. The Grammys was at Staples Center. Um, this was a very lavish banquet that they had for all the nominees. They served unlimited amounts of filet mignon at this thing. It was beautiful. <laughs> But what they wouldn't, this is the early days of rap, and you know, people were being shot and stuff. What they would not serve was a knife. So there was all this filet mignon and no knives, and not very strong plates. So you position your hand under the filet, and you carve at it with a fork. Anyway, um, it was sort of fun. And um, I got to, well, anyway, I did feel a little bit out of place. And uh, we actually won the Grammy. So this is sort of the team of people I worked with. Um, all these folks did a lot more than I did. I sat and got electronic files and I applied mathematics to them, which was sort of cool. Uh, Jamie Howarth was from, Plow, uh, from Plangent Processes and he actually, this was a wire recording which um, only lasted for about three years at the end of, right before the end of World War II. But they had to digitize this wire recording and I think Jamie held his thumb against the wire for about an hour and he probably uh, wore his finger out. And um, so I always tell people that this is, uh, this is the Grammy for math. So, um, and in all the, all the stuff that the Guthrie Society put out, they insisted that I be referred to as Dr. Short. They wanted everyone to know that they were the only ones that had a, a PhD working on their stuff. <laughs> so, so anyway, um, the, the next thing I did, which I started this sort of um, after I got sick of dealing with the uh, music restoration stuff. I basically just, I was getting phone calls at midnight and they'd last for an hour and a half and I got three words in. Um, and it was really hard to turn phrases like, the music's just too blue, man, it's too blue. And I'd have to try to turn that into math. So, <clears throat> so at any rate, um, I decided to start looking at some other problems. And actually the first problem I was looking at was ultrasound imaging, because I wanted to deal with uh, things that involved sound. And that's a lot of what my anal analysis focuses on. Um, so I started out really just with a little playground, just fooling around. I rented space. Um, I was the CEO, the CTO, the custodian. I had to clean the space. Um, and at first I hired students over the summer to do coding and things like that. And then this was right around the other economic crash. So pretty much when I start companies, the economy crashes. So <laughs> if you all want any help with investment, I know it's negative, but at least if you get out before a crash, you preserve your money. So um, the economy had crashed, and, but the government did offer these ARA grants, which stands for, I was determined to remember this, American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. I might be wrong, but no one's going to question me because I'm up here, I think. But anyway, <laughs> something like that. So this was uh, a grant that you could get. And we got almost a quarter million dollars, which was really cool. So we hired some professional coders, and we were able to take our algorithm to the point where we could make it run real time on computers um, and things like that. So then we went out and talked to investors and tried to raise money for this. And that's a I mean, that's just an unending treadmill. You just go out and pitch, go out and pitch, go out and pitch. But we were able to put together a group of angels. And I really wanted to stay away from the VCs, not because necessarily there's something bad about VCs, but they're better when the company is already out in the marketplace and they're selling products and things like that. So um, I went back to angel investors and um, we had one super angel. So this one individual actually put in the biggest chunk of money. And then the East Coast Angels came in again, uh, Walnut Ventures. Basically, when an angel group invests in you, it's just the angels writing you checks. Um, so they don't all have to write checks. It's, uh, it's still the individuals. And we had a bunch of other individuals. Later on, after developing this technology, um, we originally, what we're looking at is the cocktail party problem. We're still looking at that. And the idea is that if you have a group of people, let's say outside afterwards when everyone's talking and drinking beer, and you're trying to listen to a conversation, it's very hard. It's particularly hard for a computer. But how many people have ever been in a crowded room where conversations have gone on and they've heard their name mentioned? Is it, do you pick that up? like? from across the room, right? It's amazing how the brain can focus in on your name or some conversation about a friend of yours. So the human brain has the ability to focus in on these ideas. 
uh, these specific speakers, whereas computers have a terrible hard, terribly hard time with that. So that's what we're working on. We were originally hoping that it would be just for cell phones. So like if you're talking on your phone, but you're in a bar or if you're in a crowded place, that we would just make it quieter, make everything else quiet and focus on your speech. We solved that one pretty well, but no one cared, which this is what happens when you're doing a startup. They wanted us to solve the far field problem. And like we knew about the Amazon Alexa a year before it came out kind of thing. And once you get far away from the microphones, the sound bounces off the room in such a way that I call it audio in the wild. So that's sort of what we're uh, trying to solve. Um, Bosch is the company that it's a really big um, you know, multinational conglomerate. But they do everything from dishwashers to um, you know, auto parts. Uh, they do a lot of the in-car audio systems. So they found out about what we're doing and they invested in us, but they behaved much more like a VC. We can talk more about that later. However, we developed the technology enough that uh, this spring we got acquired by this company, Exmos, and they're out of Bristol, England. And shockingly enough, another UNH company was recently acquired by another company which was also from Bristol, England. So Bristol, England has a university there that does spin outs. And apparently, they get enough money to buy other companies from New Hampshire. So I'd love for the future for us to be able to switch that, um, switch that around. So um, why did this make sense? Uh, it turned out that Exmos makes chips that process audio, but they have DSP, cap digital signal processing capabilities built in. And so we developed algorithms and it turned out that we could put the two together. And by putting the two together, we thought we'd have a very powerful uh, story to tell. And um, that's actually true. Um, they, they just went out and raised $15 million after we, uh, they did the acquisition. And so that was sort of a nice uh, you know, check mark from the investment community. And our big audacious goal is that we want to marry the algorithm to the chip so that things like the internet of things or talking to your devices from a distance become a reality. So that's sort of what we're, we're shooting for. So um, I just want to make a couple, a few comments. And one of the things that happened during the merger acquisition talks, we were supposed to be merged by January 1st. We started doing the merger about December 5th. We closed the deal May 5th. And there may have been a very large law firm involved that ran up many, many bills. However, the process took absolutely forever. And at the end, the attorneys on the other side basically were trying to get me to sign documents that said they owned everything I thought of from the time I woke up in the morning to the time I went to bed at night. And the dream thinking was a little bit in a gray area. Um, so. But I've always said all along that my position at UNH was sort of sacrosanct and um, I was not going to change that. And so I used that as leverage. It turned out that they were, you know, double, you know, questioning, are you sure you can't give that? Are you sure you can't give that? And uh, luckily, Mark Saddam backed me up on that and uh, came through for me. And so that was, that's sort of the kind of quiet leverage that you can get from being associated with the university. The other really cool thing about being associated with the university is if your company fails, you're not on the street. You just go back and work at the university full time um, or keep, you know, keep that as your, your sole focus. So that was, that was sort of nice. And then one of the other things is, I, I didn't mention this earlier, but when we did the first spin out, as you probably all know, Space City University is at a premium. I mean, Mark had to have this building built practically so he could get space. Well, I'm kidding. Maybe he didn't have the building built, but it seems that way. Um, <laughs> so the only space we could get in 1999 was a storeroom behind the bell tower in T Hall. <laughs> it was really easy to think there approximately 55 minutes per hour. <laughs> so, but you were nice and uh, serenaded afterwards. So it was pretty cool. Um, and you know, I don't know about you, I spend a lot of time over here. This is an incredibly great environment to work in. Uh, we've got co-working space and Students come over all the time. You talk a little loud, but hey, what the heck. Um, so I think that's really great that uh, this stuff is going. There's a maker space over in the corner, and I really want that to be used more because I have a lot of broken things I'd like people to practice fixing, um, stuff like that. But uh, we've come a long way. 
All right, so the last thing I was going to finish with was just a few war stories. So the very first music downloads were supposed to be done in front of 300 journalists from Europe. And we were doing this with O2, which was the big uh, wireless part of British Telecom, so a really big company. 300 people who were supposed to show up. The CEO of O2 was going to be there doing a live music download. And we were being forced to use a device that was being built by Siemens. Siemens hadn't built the device, but they were supposed to have sent it to us several months before so we could try to get our software to run on it. The week of the, the public display, they sent us this. And when we picked it out of the box, all the chips were rattling around inside. When we opened it up, I can't remember how you open this thing, the chips fell out. And so this was approximately one day before we were supposed to do this live public demonstration. And so one of my lead engineers, Barry Hunt, he said to me, he said, well, you know, Kevin, we obviously can't run it on that, but I can only think of four ways that they could build this software. So he built the software four different ways. He sent them over the internet to the engineers at Siemens overnight. They tried them, one of them worked, the CEO walked in front of 300 journalists, did a live music download. I think it was Guano Apes, one of the worst names of a music group. It was either that or Moby, I can't remember. And did a live music download. So everyone thought, oh, it's got to be trivial. It's done. So anyway, that was uh, one of our fun experiences. And then um, the other thing is that innovation can die from neglect. And uh, this is sort of what I learned with my first company. You sort of have to defend your ideas and hope that the people at the other end, particularly the ones who control the purse strings, will listen. So I had this really interesting experience where I realized that we could do podcasts on your cell phone. So you could you know, charge your cell phone overnight and have podcasts downloaded onto your phone so that in the morning you could connect your cell phone to your car and basically get your own podcasts of whatever you're interested in on the way in. And I had the uh, board member from Charles River Ventures say to me, Kevin, that is the stupidest idea I've ever heard. I can't believe you would come up with such a stupid idea. Six months later, they invested $20 million in a company to do podcasts. So um, you just never know how things are going to work out. And you just, it's a battle all the time sort of to try to get your ideas out there. We had similar things with, you know, we wanted to do localized traffic reports. As I mentioned earlier, letting your phone calls ring through. There was a lot of stuff like that. Another interesting war story. I told you that Bosch came in and invested in us. Shockingly, shockingly, they're also investors in Exmos. So um, I'm not saying it was a shotgun wedding, but um, it was pretty clear that if we didn't merge, we would have died on the vine. So, um, there's a lot of leverage that the investors can have that you may not necessarily love, but you have to work around. And then this last one, um, with my first company, we got our first funding three weeks before the eToys crash. And for those of you who lived through the internet bubble, the eToys crash was when the descending sort of deflating balloon just went flat. That's when um, all investments stopped sort of in in the Northeast, well actually probably everywhere in the country. And I was literally spending every day trying to raise money. I would go to investor groups, I'd go to angel groups, I'd go to individuals. And every night I would try to do the research. And I was so stressed out. And eventually I realized that there's nothing I could do about the money. I don't have it, so I can't write the check. And um, it was making me absolutely crazy. I wasn't sleeping at night. And so I said, well, all I can do is work on the technology. So in some sense, if you're the tech person, I recommend figure out what you care about, try to do your best at that, and work hard at the other part. But you know, if it comes to investment and stuff, you can't necessarily control that. Just, just do your best and try to maintain your stress level. I think I'm done. So thanks for listening. Oh, <clears throat> yeah, I, I, sorry, I, uh, I missed that one. So it turns out, I've heard someone say that once you take your first dollar, you've given up control. 
So a lot of people say that if you, um, you know, as long as you maintain more than 50% ownership in a company, you feel like you're in control. But if other people put real money in, that's their money, then chances are they're going to either uh, be able to ex exert a lot of control or if you dig through the 150 pages of closing documents, you'll see that they have special rules that apply to them and not to you. And that's just the way the game's played. Um, they have lots of lawyers. They're very well protected from a legal perspective. And so the best you can do is sort of try to manage that and make sure you talk to people who've been through it before, talk to Mark, talk to people here, talk to your, you should have attorneys who help you through this um, period, have them explain to you what is the norm. The best you can do is hope for the norm and that you don't have any sort of particularly nasty terms, um, but that's a battle you have to fight all the time. Any other questions? I've got one other. Okay. So, so tell, tell, talk about how the academic environment, not necessarily the university, but in your college, in your department, how the environment, when you did the first startup, you know, how did your colleagues respond versus you know, how, you, how you think that might have changed over time? Um, I guess I can't answer that completely since I don't know how everyone felt. Um, I do know that at the time, everyone thought, this is right before the internet bubble burst. Everyone thought that if you start a startup, you get a million dollars, you're gonna be rich. Um, luckily, I didn't think that, but um, there was actually a comment made by one of my UNH colleagues at a conference, no, at a, at a talk, because it turned out that the other speaker was my business partner's husband. And he said, oh yeah, Kevin Shorty started that company, he's rich now. And the other person knew that wasn't true, and he said, well, not really. So, <laughs> um, so there's was, there was a lot of misconception out there. Um, I think the university as a whole has seen the value of getting technology out. And um, I think, actually, I should throw this back to you, Mark, but I think I've heard you say that the number one goal that the university has now is to get our technology out into the public sphere where it's going to be used. And that different types of technology have a different profile, but you, the university's goal is to get the technology out there. All right, so that might be you just license the technology, um, and you've done that with like click-through licenses for certain things. Um, we actually license images from our underwater research group where they take this incredibly cool image of something, the Marianas Trench, I guess, was one of them, and you know, Hollywood wants to license that image so they can use it in a film. Um, so we have all these different things and um, probably since um, I'm a mathematician, people who are doing copyright stuff might not have shown up today, but um, we do also deal with things like uh, copyright for uh, creative works and things like that. So I, I, think, I, I think I described that reasonably well. Fair enough? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. With any of these technologies and the diverse assets, did you did you ever file a provisional or go directly to non-provisional? What's that decision tree? I think I most of the time file a provisional, mostly because I don't ever feel like I have enough time to do it um, completely, which I also don't have enough time to do it completely when the provisional is about to run out and I have to turn it into a full patent. But um, I've also done enough patents at this point that um, I can pretty much write a provisional, hand it off to an attorney, they wrap a little bit of stuff around it and submit it. A provisional patent, if you don't know about that, is a placeholder which says to the patent office, I've done this, I believe it's patentable, put it on the shelf as proof that um, I d did it when I said I was gonna do it, and then you have a year to turn it into a full patent. And turning stuff into a full patent is a lot of work, and, um, but it's, it's worth doing. Yeah. Um, let me take uh, Nick first then. So what, what in your first startup when you <coughs> came up with the patents, I think, to some compression, was that what they were on? Yeah, it was, um, well, we had a patent on secure communication, music synthesis, audio compression, and video compression. So what, how did you go from that suite of patents to a music download hardware? Like, what was the... Well, see, that's the funny thing about when you start a business. You think you're going to do this, and it's going to cost X, something 
you always think it's going to cost a million dollars. And you try to do that, and then you start talking to customers, and they say, oh, well, that's really cool, but if you can do that, you should be, you should be able to do the thing we really care about. And then that makes it much bigger. And then when you try to do that, they say, oh, that's almost there, so now you have to do this. And in our case, I was hoping to really just license something like an MP3 player onto the phone. And um, I thought cell phone calls were pretty bad. Um, the original cell phone quality was pretty terrible. And it's back to being terrible again. It, it, there was a period where it got better. Um, and the cell phone company said, we don't care. People will pay us for this crappy audio. So that was it. We couldn't do that product. So then we had to apply it to music. And of course, music then, the standards were much higher in terms of quality. And um, we were actually ready to go with live music download services over a year before the iPod even had download services. But um, the record labels, meanwhile, MP3s are being stolen out the back door all the time. Billions of dollars are going out the door. But the record labels delayed us for a year because they wanted to evaluate our security stuff. And our security stuff was way better than anything they had, but they really weren't qualified to evaluate it. So they added this delay, and that, of course, cost money. And then, as I said before, the services that the wireless operators were setting up, they all shut down. And so we had to do the whole service. So it's like, you know, in for a dime, in for a dollar kind of thing. You just get drawn in. So when you say you had to do that, meaning in order to proceed and spend the money wisely, um, it wasn't really a question of spending the money. As we used to have to find new money usually, right? Because you're, you're out of money because you, you did what you thought you were going to do, but that still doesn't get you over the hurdle to get into the marketplace. And so it's a constant battle to try to catch up to the wave. So, yeah, Ian? So your next startup, venture capital or no venture capital? <laughs> I don't know. Um, I've heard lots of people say that the West Coast VCs are really great for founders. But they're on the West Coast, so I don't know if it's true. Um, so I don't really, I don't know what I'm going to do. It partly depends on how much money you need. So the great thing about angel investors is that they can be very cooperative with you. You usually have a very close relationship with them. But they run out of money in the two to five million dollar range. And there's a big gap between the five million and VCs don't usually want to put in less than ten million dollars. Um, so there's this intermediate level of funding which is really problematic, I think, for all companies. And um, I don't have an answer for what the best thing, way to go is. Yeah? So earlier you mentioned working with some grad students on some of the initial projects you had. So when that idea sort of develops into the beginnings of the company, what role do the grad students have sort of play? I totally forgot something else I was supposed to put on my slides. Um, uh, sorry, it was late last night. Um, but that's, that's, I'm glad you brought that up because one of the things that Jeff Soule did was he had an executive MBA program and he said, well, here's a startup possibility. Why don't you work with some of these executive MBAs? And they all had other jobs, so for them it was more of an academic process. But they literally went through and built a business plan. Turns out, you know, early business plans are not what ultimately happens, but they really put together a, a, an exciting presentation of why this could be a real company. And remember, the university had never done it before, so there, was a lot of, there were a lot of people that needed convincing. So that was a, another cool benefit I got from being here at the university. Did that specifically cover it? Uh, yeah, I was sort of curious to once maybe these ideas sort of generated actual, sort of like became an actual business, did some of the grad students sort of stay on and even like work for that company, or did they sort of just leave it sort of separate? Well, you know, the funny thing is, so um, my, my grad student who worked on the secure communication stuff, um, the National Security Agency hired him. So that was a pretty good job for him. He's actually now the chair of Principia College's math department. Um, the two undergraduate students, needless to say, having done projects like this and having their names on a patent, um, made them very attractive to grad schools. So um, they sort of got pulled into grad school. And that was the right thing for them to do at that stage in their life. So it partly depends on what people want to do. But in most of the cases, they used this experience as the leapfrog to the next level. 
Did, yeah. You said that the angel investors just write checks and that they're sounds like they're friendlier to work with, but obviously they want something in return. What is what's the point? Oh, I, I didn't mean if I said that they just write checks, I didn't mean that in a derogatory way at all. I meant that when you're when you go into an angel investment group, every person there is writing a check out of their bank account, right? So it's a very, um, people don't use words like sacred trust anymore, but it sort of feels like that. And um, for me anyway, I realized what they could do with the money instead of give it to me. So um, I, I think there's a very personal connection there. And, um, so as a consequence, when you work with them, they usually have this sort of idealistic belief that they want this technology out there. Um, so one of the things I'd love to do with our current technology is get it into hearing aids. And we're getting very close. We're running real time on chips, but the chips now take a little bit too much power and they're a little bit too big to go in your ear, but you know, it's gonna get there. And a number of our angel investors really want us to do that. So they have a real strong personal commitment to making that technology happen. And with a VC, it's usually more about, and they want to make money, but they, they like tech or they like whatever they invest in. Um, whereas the VCs, depends on the VC, but there's an investment profile. They want to have one of their companies do a 20x return, a certain number of them give a 10x return. That's, it's a little bit more cut and dried that way. Uh, why don't I take Drummond first? Sorry. As an inventor, do you think the academic system was the best place for you? Um, I've never been particularly comfortable anywhere. Um, when, when I was young, I grew up on the New York, New Jersey border, and I wanted to go to Bell Labs, um, either Bell Labs or IBM Watson Lab. And um, my first invention, I was actually working at IBM in the summer. And I thought, oh, I'm golden for, I'm gonna to go to grad school, I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna to go to Watson Lab. But they started cutting back so fast on industrial research in this country that I did my graduate work in England, I was gone for three years, I came back and the landscape had completely changed. So um, I sort of wanted that academic environment without having to teach. Um, but I do like teaching, so, and I especially liked your class, um, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, but it's it's a time thing, you know. It just it takes a lot of time, and so I feel torn all the time. Um, Maria. So you've been intimately involved with the commercialization of your technologies. How would you feel if a third party came in and you didn't have a strong role or much of a role in the party commercializing it? Well, nowadays that sounds like a dream. No. Um, <laughs> You know, it's really funny because when you do something this intensely, you feel like it's part of you. And um, I actually made the first sale for um, my company, the first company, with O2. And it just turned out that we didn't think it was a likely customer. So we sent our VP of sales to meet another customer, and I went over to talk to O2. And I walked out that day with an agreement that we were going to do something together. And that was just the coolest thing in the world. And so, and then when I realized that we had developed all this cool technology that I thought was ready to push out there, and um, the VCs didn't want to do it, that was devastating. So for me, it was sort of like mourning um, to, to leave the company like that. And I realized that maybe it's a little immature. People who've been through many startups develop a thicker skin, but I hadn't yet had the opportunity, and I was hoping I wouldn't have that opportunity, but I did. So, is that a fair enough answer? Nick, did you have a question? Sort of. I, so your second startup, it sounds like it eventually became a business-to-business -business sale. But like, yeah, so. Like you were planning on making a commercial, selling it to a, like a civilian or customer. You were looking at more of a business-to-business. -business. Well, um, there's there are lots of ebbs and flows in this second company, and I realized everyone would be tired by the time I got to that, so I didn't tell all the ins and outs, but for example, we were talking to the Alexa team before the Amazon Echo ever came out. Um, we thought we were gonna be in that product. Amazon 
in its wisdom, decided to completely reorganize the whole program, and all the people that we were close to were pushed off the project. And so, you know, that was like the rug being pulled out from under us. And, you know, in a lot of cases, a startup like that, and we had invested tons of time and effort in that, a startup would just fold and you lost your, your main potential customer. Um, so we knew what we had, but every different customer said, oh, can you put it on my chip? I'm not going to believe it until it runs on my chip. Well, they all had different chips. I had, you know, six guys. Um, in this case, they were guys. I don't mean that in a sexist sense. Um, so um, we had six people to do it, but we couldn't do it for everybody's chip. And that's when we found the XMOS chip that they were willing to work with us, and they actually had microphones integrated, so it was really useful for us. Um, and so the acquisition made sense, but it's really a strategic acquisition. My investors, I think, are pretty content because we're essentially a chip company for, I don't know, I think I had like six and a half million dollars invested, and now they're part of this big, fabulous chip company that has many, many millions of dollars of, in, of income um, coming in because they're selling chips already. So, but it's all on hold, right? We gotta wait and see how XMOS does before my original investors know if they did well or not. Yeah, Ian? So, <clears throat> do you have a technology and you found a problem for it? Or do you find, prob look for problems and then use your mathematical background to I do everything wrong in terms of um, what you're supposed to do. Um, so, like when I was trying to raise money for the cell phones, we went to all the VCs around the Boston area and they were determined there were not going to be cell towers in their towns. All the rich towns around Boston, they wouldn't let cell towers in. So we'd go in to try to demonstrate live downloads and it turned out that there wasn't even a cell phone signal. So why would I ever want a cell phone? All I'd do is call my wife to pick me up, at, it was very male dominated, call my wife to pick me up at the train station when I get home. And um, so they had no concept of what the phone would, would possibly be. And you know, we, we called them convergent devices. We were laughed out of town. Um, we actually took, I think it was this phone, took this phone to the top people in Nokia. Remember, how many people remember the name Nokia? How many people remember when Nokia was king? Yeah, many of you are too young for that. But um, Nokia was like everything. And we went in to talk to really, I can't remember what the person's title was. It was like one step below the CEO. And we showed him live downloads with a touchscreen phone. And he said, oh, no, 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 that's not a phone. Like, what do you mean? It's, it's a phone. I, I make calls on it. I'm showing it to you. He said, no, that's not a phone phone. A phone phone has buttons. And we went, we didn't know what to say. And the company went like this. But they had it in their hands. So I have no idea if that answered your question now. That, uh, but um, so anyway, it's, uh, when you're doing something really on the bleeding edge, you sometimes have to convince people that this is the future. And the funny thing is, everything we told them was going to happen has happened. And yet we couldn't get the investors, who had plenty of money, to invest in us so that we would become the Amazon of the, the wireless internet. Um, so that's sort of why I think of it as a missed opportunity. But you know, we got technology out there, the company lasted, it was sold, and so that's a, some measure of success. So yeah. in that case, do you think that the technology was almost too advanced to really be successful because people almost didn't believe it, or is that something that could happen? <laughs> well, <laughs> the technology was coming to maturity at the same time as they were trying to learn to build cell phones that did data. So. I mean, we worked with HTC to get their music player to work right. We called up um, Texas Instruments and told them that their fast Fourier transform algorithm was wrong. And they said, oh, no, it's not. So we had to show them that it was wrong, which meant that you know, we're dumping out buffers of data. Um, it, it just, it was in some sense too early, but by the same token, we sort of created an industry. And we just didn't get to reap as many benefits as would have been fun. Yeah. Did, did you ever consider approaching Apple in the early days? Did I talk to Apple? No, we didn't. Partly because um, 
we didn't have any relationships with them, they have a bit of a bad reputation of, um, or at least at the time, eating up small young companies. Um, so there was some caution there. And we were way better than them. <laughs> Their first two phones were no good. They couldn't get phone calls. We had patented protection. I figured we sue them, they'll buy us, everybody would be happy. You know what? The VCs didn't want to invest money in the suit. So I was, I was staggered by that. Um, but the thing that Apple had that we knew was important, but we couldn't touch, was that they could build the phone themselves. They went to, H I think it was HTC, but they went to one of the early cell phone manufacturers and they said, okay, we want this phone. And funny enough, it didn't have buttons because their first two that failed did have buttons. And um, you know, they did everything right. And although they never did make a music download service, they never had the data channel making the connection for the app the way we did. They were just using the internet. And so mostly people would have to plug their phones into the internet to get music from the iTunes store. We have time for, I guess, one more question. Yeah. Was the music going through data, or was it going through a different kind of data? It was data. It was the very first uh, wireless data networks. And they actually had, essentially, different servers to serve the data. And um, I don't know if you realize it, but except for a movie theater popcorn, the most expensive thing in the <coughs> world was data over wireless. And it's actually ridiculously true. Um, but at the time, I think they were getting, I think O2 told us that they were getting something like 200 pounds a megabyte of data because text messages, which were huge in Europe, and they, no one even knew what they were in the United States at the time, um, text messages take so little data that they would charge, I can't remember if it was like 10p or something like that. So people, you know, 10p is nothing, they just send their messages. And, but that racked up to something like 200 pounds per megabyte. Needless to say, if you download a song at 200 pounds per megabyte, no one was going to download a song. So um, we had to set up servers on these special, well, we had to set up software on these special servers that would deliver the data, mark that it was part of the service, and it would only be charged the fixed fee for the song. And so literally people would, um, they would send a text message, well, it depended on the network, we had to do it different ways. They would send a text message, the text message would come into the server, the server would send them software, the software would be installed on the phone, it would change the way they accessed the wireless network so that they could go through this different metering system. So, but these are the kind of, you mentioned Nick before, the things you didn't think you were gonna do. We didn't really think that was supposed to be our job, but it ended up being so. All right, well, thanks everybody.